Welcome to the People of AI podcast, showcasing inspiring people with interesting stories in the field of artificial intelligence. I'm Ashley Oldacre. Let's jump right in. This podcast is sponsored by Google. Any remarks made by the speakers are their own and are not endorsed by Google. Hello, hello, Ashley here. I'm excited to be joined by our wonderful guest today, Tina Huang, and I will share a little bit about her. Tina is a YouTuber with over 600,000 subscribers in the AI tech and career niche. She's also the founder of Lonely Octopus, a program that teaches students AI skills and then matches them with real companies to work on developing AI solutions. Previously, she was a data scientist at Meta. She holds a master's degree in computer science from the University of Pennsylvania and an undergraduate degree in pharmacology from the University of Toronto. Welcome, Tina. Thank you. Really excited to be here. It's very exciting to have you here and for you to join us because you are a YouTube star. And so it's great that you can (laughs) be on our channel and, you know, share your story with us. And so with that, we, we start with all of our guests. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm blushing now. All right, let's do it. So, well, you already covered most of it in that bio. Um, So I guess what can I say that is not covered? Take us Um, as far back. Like, you know, where were you born? All right, let's do it. So (laughs) I was born in China. I actually grew up there. Um, And then I came to North America, did my undergraduate degree in Canada. Um, and then I went to at some at some point I wanted to be a doctor um, that did not work out for me I realized I did not want to be a doctor so I learned how to code I worked in bioinformatics and then just decided to take the plunge and uh, did my master's in computer science okay so you come here for school you decide mm-hmm. you want to be a doctor what was the change at that moment where you decided or was it a moment or was it a sort of a series of small things where you're like you know what I really would like to pivot into tech um, you know what it was is my mom told me to be a doctor. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll be a doctor. Yeah. And then at some point, you know, I was just like, you know, pre- pre-med, like learning all those things and volunteering a hospital. Um, and I think as you get a little bit older, it just kind of occurred to me that I'm like, wow, like I don't actually really want to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like being a doctor is one of those professions where if you're going to do it, you should probably really want to do it. Yeah. Um, so I did feel very lost at that time. Um, Commute like it was very. I was very lucky uh, that um, computer science. I had people around me who were doing computer science, who were coding. Was this at school? So were you yeah. at? Yeah. Okay. So this was my fourth year at university at that time. Oh um, wow! Which yeah. is kind of late to also be. Super realizing late. this I guess I know well. I mean not too late but still existential crisis yeah. I'm like oh my god what am I going to do with myself wow. um so luckily I joined a bioinformatics lab so one of the oh, a bioinformatics lab mm-hmm. so combining that pharmacology degree with um with the the coding aspect mm-hmm. with the computer science aspect and engineering aspect so I did that for a little bit of um I think I did that for about a year and then after that, I was like, oh, like, you know, I'm just going to go do a master's in computer science and then see what's out there. Um, also, when I was in school, I wasn't really aware of tech or any of these things that existed. I just knew that computer science would be um, a good degree to have because it would open up a lot of doors. So that was pretty much it. And then after that, I went to tech and um, I pretty much just stayed in the States and then I went to a couple companies. Um, yeah. And then. And so like why tech? Like why not finance? I mean, because, you know, you have sort of finance or architecture or, um, you know, a hotel school. Like there's there's a variety of different things that 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 one could go into. But w- so what what specifically about computers did you find interesting or was it purely like, you know what, this is the future. I need to get a job. This is going to equal a job, so I'm going to follow this. Pretty much it was that. Because with a pharmacology degree and an undergraduate degree, there was very few options that I could have done um, at that point. And fun fact, I did work at a bank before at Goldman Sachs. Oh, okay. I did do that. Um, So my story, it's definitely like, you know, all over the place. So undergraduate pharmacology, did not know what to do with myself, did not want to be a doctor, had an existential crisis, Mm -hmm. went into bioinformatics, decided, you know what, I'm just going to go go into this this computer science thing. Went to the States, did a master's at UPenn, um, and then started just applying to jobs. Landed a job at Goldman Sachs, uh, worked there in software. Um, and then after that, um, so when I was graduating, so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna apply to a lot of jobs as well. Data science sounded like an interesting job at that time. So I applied, got a job at Meta as a data scientist. 
Okay. All right. So what was that like working both before, you know, at Goldman Sachs and then also at Meta, sort of working for these big corporations? Was that something that you were like, okay, I've landed. I finally am where I'm supposed to be and I'm really happy with what I'm doing. I think for me, um, now, you know, looking back, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Like I was, I, there's this concept called identity capital. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was mostly, I'm not sure who came up with it, but I believe it was, um, gosh, I forgot her name, but it was from the book, The Defining Decade, which is your 20s. The idea is that you should be building a certain skill set. Um, and then after you build that skill set over time, you can start incorporating other things into what you want to do. Because in the end, um, it's not like if you're trying to find a job, it's not really about you, like what you want to do. It's you have to somehow provide value to a company, to like society as a right. whole. Right. Um, for example, you might be like, I think I'm going to be a software engineer, but nobody can hire you as a software engineer if you don't know how to code. Right? right. So at that time, I was just building up identity capital. And then when I went to Goldman Sachs, I think that was that I enjoyed a large part of what I did at Meta as well. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed my time there. I feel like I learned so much and the people I met were super super inspiring Um, and then over time I started incorporating other aspects of what I was interested in where I felt like I had a more unique skill set for example I've always loved to just to to talk essentially to tell stories so I started incorporating that when I started my YouTube channel and over time it kind of just crafted itself to what I do right now I don't even know what my job is I just say like I do internet stuff these days (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Well, I want to get into that. So, but before we do this concept of identity capital, I've never heard of this concept before. And so, based on what you've explained, it's essentially identity capital is acquiring skills that are going to be useful and that are needed within, as you said, a company or within society. And so, what are some examples of those right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So coding is an example. It's something that's useful. Um, Engineering is is useful. Um, Languages is one of those things that are useful as well. So really any skill set that you may learn um, that provides value is considered identity capital. Um, It really is such a wide range of, of things that you can learn that you can do. Languages. I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Say more. Languages. Um, I believe you speak Mandarin. Yes, a little. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I <laughs> yeah, do. That's conversational. That's and French. And French. Okay, okay. <laughs> See, that's I definitely identity capital because that's a skill set that you can provide value for, um, right? Like whether that be, you know, you know better than me in terms of like your ability that you can teach, right? If you know Mandarin, you can teach people who only speak Mandarin, English, or other other languages. Um, mm-hmm. There are specific roles that you can have in which people who don't speak those languages will not be able to do. So all of these things like added together, they're all things that make you very, very valuable. So the more identity capital that you build, the more valuable it is. And the more identity capital that you build, the more freedom you have to do the things that you want to do as opposed to do things that you have to do. So is identity capital similar to like a a skill on a resume? Um, Yeah, I would say it's it's similar in that sense. I think it's just a little bit more than just um, a certain job or a skill set. Like it's just it's yeah, it's pretty much as broad. If it's useful to society uh, somehow, then it's Mm -hmm. considered identity capital. Yeah. So would soft skills also fall into identity capital as well? Absolutely. Being able to communicate, that is actually a very important skill yeah. to have. Um, yeah. That's one of the things I always say, like, it doesn't matter how good you are at doing something. If you don't know how to communicate, then it doesn't actually matter because nobody's <laughs> going to know what you're doing anyway. <laughs> um, so I think very, very much so being able to read a room, being able to talk to someone and understand what it is like, what it is about them, uh, what what questions to, to ask people. Mm-hmm. That's super important as well. Yeah. Yeah, so you do a lot of that in your current day-to-day job. I do, yeah. I do, I do, yeah. So let's so let's get into that. So you've shared your very interesting path into tech. And when did this YouTube idea start? Did it start while you were at Meta or did it start earlier on or... And and why? What was the sort of what was the 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 like? Hey, I'm 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 want to put this on YouTube. And what is this? Like, what did you want to put on YouTube? Well, it all started for me during the pandemic, where I was very bored. So I was like, what should I do with myself? I'm so bored. Um, it started actually around the same time that I started my job, um, at Meta. So the first video I ever made was a review of my master's degree, um, at Penn. 
So because I just thought like I think this can be valuable to other people. Maybe if they are also interested in doing something like this, then you know I'm just gonna put it out there. Right. Um, and yeah. you say, when you say review, what does that mean? I just talked about my experience during the masters. What I think is uh, what I enjoyed about it, what I didn't enjoy about it, who I think it's suitable for. Mm. Um, yeah, and I honestly didn't think too much about it and just posted it because I was like, "What's the worst case scenario? I get embarrassed, or nobody wants to watch my video, then it's fine. You know, I'll just take it down." Um, yeah. So yeah, I honestly just didn't think too much about about it. I just did it. I think that's actually one of the traits, which is both about me, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. I, I don't really think that much. <laughs> I just do it. <laughs> and then I think about it later. Action um, biased. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And I'm like, why which did I Which might be that? good identity capital, depending on which industry, which company you're for. Yeah, I think I think it very much can be all those skill sets together. Um, there's those are things that you provide value. And I think a very important thing is to realize where you provide value in understanding yourself mm -hmm. um, is is really, really important to yeah. find the things that you're both good at and the things that you like doing. Yeah, absolutely. So you put this video up where you did an assessment of your master's degree. And then what happened? I believe 10 people watched it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And, and then after that, I was like, oh, this is quite fun. Um, so then I just started doing that. So I put a second video on. And then I really just was just like, I'm just going to keep doing this a video a week, see what happens. Do this for six months. If it doesn't work out, doesn't work out. Um, and who knows what's going to happen. So that's And it was what just like sort of a, a vlog of your life or, or was it industry specific? So it, I never really did. I think I've tried to do a couple vlogs, um, but not really a vlog type. There's another concept that comes in. Sorry, I'm like throwing so many Oh, concepts. I love it. No, um, no, I love these concepts. I I'm learning so much. <laughs> yeah, the concept is so there's like an unfair advantage, right? Which is basically what are the things that you have about yourself, like the identity capital, for example, mm -hmm. that make it so that you're better than other people right. um, at a specific thing, right? Like not everything, but a specific thing. So in my case, what my unfair advantage was on YouTube would be the fact that I have a master's degree in computer science, the fact that I have a job at Meta as a data scientist, right? So this puts me apart from other people. Um, it allows me to talk about things that would be harder for other people to talk about if they didn't have my experience. I could have become like a vlogger or a food um, person. I, I don't know what those are called. You know, <laughs> there's like I, there's a lot of things I could have done yeah. and that would have been fun for me, but it, w it would have been very difficult for me to stand out in those mm -hmm. niches because it's there's so many people doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I really have to be like competing with a pool of people um, I don't know if competing is the best word, but, you know, like it's just that barrier of entry is mm -hmm. relatively low. While if I talk about data science, I talk about computer science, I talk about engineering and careers. This is something that it's actually quite easy for me to to develop, um, mm -hmm. to stand out in that sector. Because, first of all, barrier entry is pretty high. You kind of need to first have a computer science degree. And right. then you also have to be working in tech right. to talk about data. So naturally, right. that's very, very few people. Right. Another really big thing is I am female. So mm. this is, it was everybody, they, they were all guys, right? right? I was actually the only person right. um, in the data niche at that time who was female. So that was another aspect that made me stand out. Yeah. So these are all the unfair advantages that I had. So that's why I chose to talk about the topic that... I talked about I really enjoyed it but it, honestly there's like other things that I enjoyed as well but that was I knew that was what would have the highest likelihood of me being successful okay okay and success means what in that case like it would just be views in that sense like people wanting to watch my my content um, people wanting to connect with me yeah and so it sounds like you've been pretty successful with over 600,000 subscribers. Yeah, I think I'm honestly being really lucky as well. Um, I think people people choose the things that they do and then the, the luck, they make their own luck. But at the same time, um, I think I've been really, really fortunate to be in this position to be able to say I can genuinely do the things that, that I love. Um, yeah, and then just building from there. Yeah, that's so great. That's so interesting. So, okay, so you you're still but and you're still at you're still working while you're doing videos as well. And is there at some point where you decide, "Hey, I can do this full time?" And so are you continuously working and doing the videos at the same time? I was working and doing the videos at the same time. Um 
like about like a year and a half Mm -hmm. in which I was doing that or I don't know something about between a year and a half and two years I think around two year mark um, I was still doing that so yeah this is um, again was a decision point for me in which I I was starting to see some moderate success in terms of people were were watching my videos there were some sponsors that were wanting to work with me I'm like oh my god I can make money through this I think right and then there was a little bit of AdSense as well Uh, so I was like I did not you know like I didn't expect that to happen but I was like okay like I could potentially see myself doing this um, somehow and then being able to go for it and just like maybe maybe I should take that chance so this is actually really logical when I decide to quit when I did um the thing I set for myself is if I can make more money doing YouTube than I did at my job I would quit because the idea for me was um that would be like I if I could do that then I know that I would be stable enough at least you know I did have some savings and things like that but I could have seen there was the potential, right? right? It was it was three months. I was like, if I can make a monthly enough, um, that it was more than I could have made um, at my full time job, then I would take that chance. Um, and I also kind of told myself, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? It doesn't work out. Like, I know I have the identity capital that mm-hmm. I could find another right. job if I right. had to. Right, 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 right. What a risk! <laughs> it was. It was a risk. Um, I would say it's a calculate. It was a calculated yes. risk yes, in that sense. Like yeah. yeah, and then it was just one of those things. I think um, I always just see when there's certain opportunities. For me, I just realize like what I regret it if I didn't do it. That's what I asked myself, and I think I would have regretted it if I didn't do it. So then I did it. Yeah, and you've been doing super well, and so you've now have this YouTube channel, but you also have. Uh, a company, an organization that you started called Lonely Octopus. So I'd love for you to talk about both of those. Yep. So first of all, the name. People ask me that about about this a lot. If anybody can guess why, then I will, I don't know, give you a cookie the- or <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> but why, the, why you've named your company the yeah. Lonely Octopus? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay. Uh, yeah, it's called Lonely Octopus. So it's a program that teaches people AI skills and then I'm a big proponent of you can learn a bunch of things, but really what matters is when you actually get to apply them. So we teach them skills and we give them the opportunity to work with real companies in order to apply the skills that they learn to provide value for companies and incorporate AI into their businesses. So when did you get familiar with AI? Because not every it's not a I mean, it is probably now, but I don't know that it was a given a couple of years ago that you would go into computer science and then that would sort of equate with AI so when did you how did you get into that into that field yeah I think like in terms of AI it's been very popular these days um, because of generative AI but really AI is actually a pretty old field it's been around for for a very long time and the term AI is actually very vague uh, terminology if you ask people what it is that they do who actually work in a field, they wouldn't say, I work in AI. They usually would say a subfield um, of right. what they're doing. Right. Because really what it is is and that... A subfield would be like machine learning or it would learning. be large language models or exactly. it would be... Um, what's another one? So like in this case, large language models and the like, there'll be generative AI, right? They'll right. be working on that. But there's other fields that they could be working on deep learning. They could be working on a variety of different things. Um, so in my case... It was really because in computer science, I did take courses that were related to, I guess we call like AI in Mm -hmm. that sense. And also because I worked in data as well. So a large part of that is actually data science, machine learning, the evolution of that Mm and incorporating other aspects as well, like computer vision, all of these things. So um, I think what was it was relatively easy for me to just focus on those areas um, specifically because I had a pretty good foundation about these core principles Um, and it's it's if you have like a good engineering background Mm -hmm. um, and if you really dive into those uh, it's it's actually pretty easy to pick up a lot of different skills they're they're all like very related to each other yeah Um, yeah, so that's when I started getting into that because that was when Gen AI came out, it was really where there was a lot of value um, that could be added to companies. So then I, I talked a little bit more about AI, talked about how... Um, on your channel? Yep, yep, on my channel, how it is that people can incorporate that, how to learn AI, mm-hmm. um, how do you provide value using generative AI. 
But really, um, in terms of if you ask me, when was the first time that you used AI in that sense? I guess it w- was all the way back when I was doing bioinformatics, right? I was doing machine learning. Like all of those things right. are technically in the field of right. artificial intelligence. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that makes sense. Did you notice an uptick in viewership when you started talking a lot more about AI? Mm. I feel like it's actually, it's been about the same, I would say, Mm because like my core audience, um, they are interested in these topics. I would say like, I think it's attracted people that are outside of say like more technical people Mm -hmm. for sure. So I was, okay, I guess the answer is like, yes, there has been more of an uptake. There has been more people who are specifically interested in those topics Mm -hmm. um, that have been coming in. Um, But I think... um, it's still pretty related to the things I normally talk about. So it's not like I decided to go talk about a completely different field. It, right. Yeah, not like I just suddenly right. decided to be a blogger or something like right, that. Right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so you talked about, about uh, Lonely Octopus and the origin of that company. And um, how, did, how did that start? Because based off of the videos that I've watched uh, on your channel you sort of have this this one f- one way flow of information right of the things that you've learned of advice of tips that you sort of put out there but your company is it's more two way now was that intentional or what was sort of the 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 founding the story the the idea behind creating your company mm mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really started with the idea that I just like talk about these things and I give tips and I give like certain project ideas and I give people like, oh, here's like some things that you can do. Um, But it was more like people like, okay, I did this now. What should I do? Right. And I'll be like, you should do a project. Like, What project should I should I do? I'm like, I don't know. You just like find a project uh, right to do. And they're like, what project? So I'm like, okay, like clearly there's like a need for this. I feel like there's a gap between learning, doing some courses and using those skills, maybe even doing personal projects and actually providing value um, in terms of Mm. with a company or as a freelancer or whatever it is. So there's that gap. And I wanted to fill that gap for people. So it's like Um, the application, right? You can learn it. And then there's a gap between learning the skills and then actually getting a job. And that gap is the application of actually working on like real, real problems and solving mm -hmm. real problems using what you've learned. Exactly. Uh, That was like the biggest gap for people. And another thing was when you apply for a job, um, the thing that they always look for is past job experience. Right. Right. But the question is, how are you supposed to get past past job experience if nobody will hire you because you have no past job experience? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 22. Exactly. So that's also a problem I wanted to solve in Mm -hmm. the sense that I wanted to provide a structured program where I know I'm teaching people the the skills that are necessary um, and they can directly apply that to a project from a real company. So they have that's that's um, that's real job experience, right? Yeah, that they're absolutely. getting there. They're working with stakeholders. They're providing value. Um, they're doing all the things that you need to do. Um, and then with that, it it's really it's re- I I really see how much it has helped people to kickstart their careers, or to upskill, or to change their careers, or anything like that. Because now you have that actual experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have made that connection with the the company itself, right? We've actually had a lot of students get hired by the company that they were working with yeah. during Lonely Octopus. And we facilitate that process, but we don't actually intervene. We'll just be like, okay, like, you know, you like you can help you can talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, we'll help support it. But if you decide to get hired, then you know, you you, you guys can like can do that. Yeah. Um so just again, it's like making that that final jump, like that little mm-hmm. bit of that bridge. Um, right. And we've really seen so many students be able to leverage that mm-hmm. and be able to just to catapult their their careers wherever whatever direction it is that they want to take within the AI field. That's really wonderful. And I bet you there's a lot of very, very happy people out there <laughs> who've been able to make the jump. Yeah, um, a lot of people becoming freelancers, um, a lot yeah. of people who are doing like lateral uh, moves in, within a company. A lot of people who are working in certain fields, like uh, fields like accounting or something like that, and then realize like, oh, like I can incorporate AI and suddenly a whole world opens up for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially right now. And so I'm curious as to what is your typical um like student demographic who are the students that you work with is it is it um 
Is it, you know, professionals that are already well established in a certain industry that then are looking to pivot into AI? Or is it students graduating from uh, college or from graduate school? Or is it, um, you know, professionals who already have sort of a, a, a little bit of a background and who just need that extra leap? Like who, who are the who are the students that you're working with? Yep. So within Lonely Octopus, we do get a lot of different people coming in. Um, I would say if you split them up, it would be people who just graduated from university, were about Mm -hmm. to graduate from university. Mm -hmm. Uh, You also get people who are professionals in in something that's not tech related, um, not related to AI at all, like accounting, marketing, these type of roles. And then you also get people who are more technical. Maybe Mm -hmm. they worked as a software engineer and they feel like their careers, like they kind of like need a little boost um, to learn about these new skills and then, you know, upskill themselves to try to see if they can maybe start freelancing, maybe start doing like... I could get another job that's more relevant to to recent developments. So um, for the people in college who are just about to graduate, yeah. I empathize a lot with them because at that time I literally didn't know what to do with myself. I'm like, right. oh God, <laughs> it's right. a central crisis. Right. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of where a lot of people graduating from college stand. Um, honestly, like especially with people graduating these days with the way that the economy is, the way that the job market is, uh, it's cooling off right now. I think it's even more so um, in terms of like, what should I do with myself? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do I actually want? What provides value? Yeah. So for those type of people, when they come to Lonely Octopus, uh, when they're doing that, it's really to learn certain skills that are more specialized than what, like, say if they just want to get a job, right? right. Um, it's, it's really, it's actually quite hard because if you just graduated, you don't have any work experience. Right. It's very difficult to stand up because pretty much everybody around you is, is the same. Yeah, yeah. And then you just kind of like, hopefully yeah. you try to apply to a bunch of companies and hopefully they, they come back and tell you to, you can do an interview <laughs> with them. Right. Um, so for them, this is an opportunity to have a skill set that is more specialized, something that can stand out. Um, so when they're applying to a certain company, they're not just a generic other person graduating from university. It's like an actual skill set. And it's also work experience. Right. So, um, again, like what people always care about recruiters are like what they like seeing is relevant work experience. Well, there you go um, to be able to have that. It's also a good opportunity for them to explore different industries that they wouldn't have um, that they wouldn't have exposure to. And Mm -hmm. it's a lot lower commitment than doing like a full internship or getting another job because it's only between two to four weeks. Right. So they choose like a company that's in a certain field that they think is interesting. If if they like it, great. Maybe they'll actually continue working um, with that company. If they don't like it, you know, that's fine. It was two to four weeks. Um, and you have that relevant experience and you can go do something else. So that would say um, is the main appeal for people um, who are just graduating um, or are about to graduate. For the professionals... um, this group is, uh, I yeah. This group professionals is, that are not that that uh, have a, an established career, but not in tech and not in AI. Yes. Yeah, so this is actually our largest population. Yeah. Um, people that are trying to in. pivot into the industry. Yeah, we're just like you know things are happening. I should probably keep up with this. Mm-hmm. Like, what are some mm-hmm. opportunities that are coming up? Um, and I don't really know what to start or, you know, you're already established in your career. You have your day to day things that are going on. It's quite hard to put aside that time by yourself. It's pretty lonely as well yeah. as there's a hint right. um, <laughs> to to do that yourself. You sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> it is like self-learning yeah. these things. It can be very lonely. And then you also get caught up in your head because like, oh, like, what should I learn? Like, you know, right. Um, Where do I start? There's a rabbit hole of information. Every every website I go on. Exactly, exactly. So this is a structured way for them to learn these skill sets. Um, It's also a way for them to realize that there's actually a lot of things you can combine AI with, uh, say like with marketing, Um, Mm -hmm. you can combine AI with accounting, right? You can combine AI with law. Um, And once you gain that skill set, you like really the doors open for you so much. Because say even for we've had people who um, would also so accountants, and then they would learn about artificial intelligence and those specific skill sets. They join that together, and suddenly they're able to do freelancing um, for companies, mm-hmm. other accounting firms that mm-hmm. like, oh, like I should probably incorporate AI. What should I do? I don't know. Um, certain things like that. So they can start freelancing careers. Um, they can also get more specialized jobs, like working as an accountant in AI company. Mm-hmm. So there's those fields that open up. And for those who have their own business as well, they realize that they can incorporate AI into their own business mm-hmm. and be far more productive um, than they were previously mm-hmm. and be far more specialized as well than they were previously. So that does represent a pretty 
big group of people and I think um, there's a vol- there's a lot of value that's derived and because they are already pretty established oftentimes really like once they you know they, they see what's there they can piece it together and then right. they create really really cool things after that so I love catching up with people it's like really creative ways <laughs> that they incorporate AI into their businesses like I don't claim any credit to that like if you told me what to do I, I was just like I don't I don't really know um, how to do that but I just I love that so much sometimes you just need to give people just you know a little bit of, of a push in the right direction right. and then they're able to create really really cool things yeah absolutely and the final group of people yeah. are the technical people. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, um, they've been doing something for a while now, like software engineering. Like They, they obviously know those skill sets. Um, but, you know, they, a lot of them after a while, like they want to be learning new things. They want to incorporate um, like more of the new technologies into their existing knowledge. And sometimes it's actually pretty hard to do that um, yeah. because you're kind of very like, You've been doing the software things for for like maybe a longer period of time in the same company where you're just doing something that's pretty niche and specialized mm-hmm. in certain companies. Mm-hmm. It can be quite difficult to expand that by yourself. It's the similar kind of inertia that you have in the sense like, gotta learn a new thing. I don't know what to learn. Where should I start? I have my job. Um, like it's that same kind of issue um, that people would have. So in that case, after learning about these new skills, they're able to upskill themselves. Like maybe they realize like, oh, like I can combine this these skill sets. Uh, we have a lot of people in that category going mm-hmm. to freelancing mm-hmm. because they already have these technical skill sets. Right. They incorporate these AI parts into it. Um, and a lot of companies are looking for people to incorporate AI into their businesses. It's 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 such a growing um, need yeah. because there's just not that many people who know how to do AI AI stuff uh, to to do this but all the companies know like I have to incorporate AI if I do not do that then I'm going to be left behind Um, right and that that's just the perfect combination you're coming in as someone look I have experience working um, on AI products I can help you incorporate that I can build you an AI product and solve the problem that you're trying to solve so a lot of these people go into freelancing um, after that right right that's that's such an interesting different sort of set of 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 professionals and individuals that that you work with they have a cer- already a certain established set of skills and what kind of skills do you teach them so like do does everybody learn coding or is it really tailored depending on the individual uh, so each person who comes into our program, they get a personalized study plan um, mm-hmm. because like self-studying, if you know how to code, you know, you don't need to go learn how to code again. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Of course. But there's some people say you're an accountant, you're interested in doing that. Um, then we would put a course um, around coding mm-hmm. and then we teach people how to do prompt engineering. This is like a uh, something yeah. that I'm a big I, I really think the, I think prompt engineering is the evolution of coding. I think it's mm-hmm. where a lot of. It's, it's where a lot of things are heading in, in, in doing, uh, having AI solutions and building products in the future is going to be in prompt engineering. So mm-hmm. we do ask everybody to learn about prompt engineering uh, when they're coming in. And then it's based upon what your interests are. So we have these core skill sets. Um, I think you can get away with a lot of no code tools. And there are mm-hmm. some people, if you're telling me, I just like hate coding, this is like, I just like don't want to do it. Okay, no problem, right? Yeah. You don't have to do yeah. that. Yeah. But I usually try to... Um, help people like I I try to recommend learning at least the basics of how to code and how it is that certain models work Mm -hmm. because that's going to be when you're building certain solutions um, that becomes quite useful right just maybe it's like a small thing right you know how to code just make your life a lot easier than if you're trying to like figure out which no code tool exactly does the thing that you need it to do as opposed to just like writing two lines of code Um, do you recommend a specific language like python Yes, I do recommend Python. I think it's the easiest language to learn. It's also what a lot of um, AI products, it's it's the like, they all support Python yeah. um, doing that. So I do recommend that. But each person does have their own personalized plan. I think uh, what's really important, like whether you're doing Lonely Octopus or, or whatever it is that you're doing, mm-hmm. to really think Think about what skill sets that you already have and then what it is that you can learn in order to make your to make yourself um, to upskill yourself, to make yourself more unique. Um, Yeah. yeah. And then we try to combine those things together. Also, we ask people, like, what do you want to do? Like, why do you want to why do you want to learn AI? Right. What's the goal? 
Exactly. And we incorporate all that together into a study plan. So that really represents the basics. Yeah. Um, but I would say that's like 20%. Um, mm-hmm. The rest of the 80% is the projects that you're working on, both right. in the program and with the companies, because that's where a lot of the real learning comes in. Right. Um, we so also the, the 20% is sort of getting you set up. And then once you have sort of that basic, then it's like, okay, now go do it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people, um, they say they derive the most value because that's also the hardest part, right? They're yeah. like, you have to actually go do it. Like, oh my God, I have to actually do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of like take you over that. We provide yeah. you support. Yeah. Um, in that sense, we also do have events that are happening. Uh, for example, how do you build like certain products using open source mm-hmm. um, large language models, like using like closed source, uh, you know, all these different types. Um, there is about, you know, more on the visualization side there's about AI art so we also really have this uh, full spectrum of events that mm-hmm. people can attend based upon whatever it is that they're interested in but then also I do live stream weekly mm-hmm. um, about AI topics mm-hmm. so uh, sometimes it's AI news sometimes it's about building certain things mm-hmm. sometimes it's like how to use large language models for example um, so if you want to like keep up to date with that you can also join the live streams and we would just talk about it we'll walk through certain things um yeah and then if you're interested then you can come if you're depending on what the topic is um so yeah like all of those i think it's really important to stay up to date at least like be aware of what's Mm -hmm. happening right um sometimes it does get pretty tiring because like every single news is the biggest news ever allegedly um, when it comes to ai stuff Mm -hmm. um i think you don't need to follow all of it but just understand the underlying trends Mm -hmm. that are happening like the movements the actual movements that are happening yeah um within the workplace and within yeah within the workplace and there there definitely are they're a lot quieter and they're less flashy than say like the coolest new hardware or software thing that comes out um this is more in terms of you just start noticing little things around you that ai is being incorporated into Hmm. so with all this information how do you personally stay up to date with everything that's going on in the ai space yeah what I like to do is instead of keeping track of whatever like thing it is that is is all hyped up right now, um, think about the core trends that are happening, right? The base technologies, Mm -hmm. because really everything is built on top of these base technologies. Mm -hmm. All of these little products that are coming out, um, which are really useful, right? They're really cool. And a lot of them are actually really useful as well. They actually just all stem from the same technologies, um, which is which is like usually large language models um, that are there. So if you, for example, if you look at the evolution of large language models and you track that Mm -hmm. then you're able to track what's happening and be able to understand like what it is that the the industry is actually evolving into so that's the evolution of what happens and ultimately it was just foundationally a large language model it's just gotten better and better and now with gemini it's multimodal and there's just more capabilities but it's not a different concept Precisely, right? The yeah. multimodality that comes in and are suddenly people are creating tools that have vision, for example, and audio. Right. It's not like that is so significantly different than not having vision and audio. It's just because the base model became better and there's right. multimodality now. Right. Um, something I like to keep track of is, for example, when you first start off, you have your chatbots. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from the chatbots, you have RAG that happen. And RAG is basically when you're able to take real-time data and make it a lot better and supplement um, what is the large thing language models already trained on right and rag is retrieval augmented generation correct yeah. yes um, and then the next evolution of that is going to be co-pilot so co-pilots are things that you can work alongside you so you're able to increase mm-hmm. your productivity mm-hmm. and then these days uh, now we have agents so agents are able to function autonomously on specific roles like for example you can have an agent that's a software engineer agent so it's able to perform tasks of what um, a human software engineer would do So that evolution is simply being able to perform more and more of the tasks that are associated with a specific role. Um, So if you track that evolution of what's Mm -hmm. happening, when you suddenly see a breaking new software engineer agent and another marketing agent, uh, it just means that there's agents that are evolving in general. So if you keep track Mm -hmm. of that. Another big trend um, that I'm seeing is, is, is the fact that as these tools are being developed, as these technologies are being developed, then you have the movement of privacy and safety. 
right. that's coming into play. So right, this is course, also yeah. a part to really pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and by the way, like these trends, if you're interested in this field, you should be learning the base technologies that are that are supporting these trends that are happening. Mm-hmm. So another great place to get into that's only going to be evolving um, and becoming more and more important is on the um, safety side of things, mm-hmm. security and safety, mm-hmm. uh, because it's kind of like as your technology evolves, you have to be able to control it. Um, so mm-hmm. a lot of people are thinking about how is it that I can be detecting um, what is AI generated, what is not AI generated. Mm-hmm. Misinformation is yep. really, really huge, um, especially when certain elections are up. Like you have like elections coming right. up, something like right. that. This is going to be like a huge thing right. to be able to control. Um, and on the side of like security as well. Um, so like, for example, companies, you could use like certain large language models, but maybe it doesn't. Um, abide by like HIPAA or something like that Mm -hmm. if you're in the medical field so there's this trend of also open source models like how do I like what how do I use open source models so I'm able to build something that would abide by these these rules um, these laws Um, also like local local models like so Mm -hmm. these are all things that are evolving in order to help people Um, there's more variety of solutions that you can come up with Mm -hmm. so if you're tracking that then you're also able to see there's a lot more products that are built on top of open source models as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's fascinating well i google just released Gemma. Mm -hmm. um have you been able to use that at all I played around with it, and actually, we are um, going to be building some products based upon uh, Gemma and other different open source models, and then just see, oh, like how, like what it is that well, open source models we can use for more for specific cases. How do you fine tune them? So that's actually something that you should stay tuned. I'll be talking more about um, using these models. Yeah, I think it's really like tracking again, like the evolution of open source models. That's also pretty important to look at because when you see those capabilities that are coming out, mm-hmm. then you realize what it is that can be possible, what's possible to be built yeah. um, from them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so exciting. So do folks come to you with a concern about AI sort of taking over their jobs or replacing their jobs and then help working with you to figure out how to uh, incorporate or, or learn a new skill or incorporate AI into their existing job to sort of to make them, as you said, to sort of enhance this skill set, this experience that will differentiate them moving forward mm-hmm. um my sort of understanding of this is that ai really is a, is still at, at a stage where it's a tool i don't know that it's necessarily something that's going to replace anything so i'd love yeah i actually recently did a video um that was called which jobs will survive ai in which i systematically go over all the jobs and then eliminate them based upon uh, what the research that has been done. So <laughs> that was a oh, very wow. interesting video to do. Okay. To, to be fair, I don't believe that this video is like, I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm just trying mm-hmm. to showcase to people um, that, okay, like there's things that are going to be impacted, right? We need to like think about it. We can't just have the ostrich effect in which we try to like yeah. not think about it. And right. hopefully, you know, it doesn't right. happen. Right. Um, so I, I think to answer your question um there's there's two folds in terms of what you can think about the first one is how you can think about what how what ai is going to impact and my Mm -hmm. second point being what you should do about it um as as an individual so maybe i can just go through both of these so first of all i actually want to say um is ai going to replace jobs yes It, it is going to replace jobs well like any any technological evolution jobs come and go exactly yeah right because at some point you had before alarm clocks existed. You have people who literally knocked on people's windows to wake them up. <laughs> right. Um, milkmen used to be a thing because there's no refrigerator. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. So there's right. always going to, is it going to replace jobs? Yes. It's going to replace some jobs. Right. Um, but yeah, right, before right. I get into what you should do about it. Um, so there's the concept of like, what is it that AI will be taking over? So again, this is conjecture. This is actually based upon a study, which maybe we can link in the show notes sure. as well, because I can't remember right now. Yeah. Um, super interesting study. So as opposed to um, usually when they think, when people think about which jobs will be replaced, which ones will be augmented, people think about what are the skills that AI inherently has. So there's this um, paradigm in which we can talk about exposure as well as complementarity. So exposure Mm -hmm. is the ability of AI performing certain tasks that people generally do. And complementarity is the um, 
so they can think about it as a protective factors in which society will not allow certain roles to be replaced by AI. So an example mm-hmm. of high exposure, high complementarity would be that of a lawyer or a judge. Mm-hmm. A lot of that can um is actually exposed a lot that AI can actually do a very good job at. Right, because it's about collecting information. So the lawyer would use AI to collect a lot of information. Yeah, like a lot of, like we're really, and it's logic, right? Like right. you're trying to, it's like, here's the law. And then right. you like either follow it or like not follow it. Right. Um, and present the evidence supporting that. So right. so AI is actually quite good at doing this kind of thing mm-hmm. and making these connections. However, it also has high complementarity, uh, which is the fact that most people are probably not going to be cool with it. If your lawyer happens to be AI or if your judge happens to be AI. Right. Um, right. So there's that's, a human component that's super important that mm-hmm. there's more value there and, and safety and, and yeah, reassurance and having an actual human exactly. there representing you. Or like a doctor, for example, or a surgeon. Right. right. Most people are probably right. not going to be cool with that. Yeah. Even if like maybe theoretically it actually has higher incidents AI is better at doing certain things but you're probably not going to be cool with going to a doctor and seeing a robot instead right Um, so those are examples that um, will have high exposures these will not be replaced um, by AI they will be augmented and enhanced by AI Mm -hmm. to be more Mm -hmm. productive Mm -hmm. Um, then there's going to be high exposure and low complementarity so take my own job for example creating content on YouTube Yep, on YouTube, other platforms, anything like that. We already see a lot of AI-generated content. So there's high exposure. Clearly, it can be automated. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, there's going to be high, sorry, low complementarity here because there's not as many productive factors in terms of content-wise. That's why you'll see a lot of AI content as well. The general public typically doesn't, is not as uh, opinionated about whether the content comes from either a, you know an automated system or a person. I mean, I think there I think people do lean towards wanting to be mm-hmm. wanting to see more of a person, but you're right. It's less the the risk or the not the risk, but yeah, the the resistance. The resistance. Yes, is, exactly. Is less. is less. Yeah. Yeah. Like you won't be like, "Oh no, I'm not going to watch this video because the voice is AI," right? right. You'll probably just be like, "Oh, like whatever." But it's cool. So I'm just going to keep watching yeah, it. Yeah, the content's interesting. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's an example of a role that is um, at risk of being automated. Mm-hmm. And then there's a third category, just has low exposure. So things like, for example, it carries, um, for example, uh, like carries. Like if you're if you're like caring for old people. Um, oh, carries. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. people like that. Um, is likely they just have low exposure in the sense that AI is not very good at doing the things that they're they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so these people are not going to be at risk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's something. If you think about that in terms of your own job, uh, try to think about that. I think it would be a really interesting exercise. Don't freak out too much. I just want to say like this, this is just a theory yeah, right. out there. But if you right. want to have some guidance in terms of like what should I like, is this something that I should be worried about or not worried about? Mm-hmm. Um, so with all that being said, right, maybe you find yourself like myself in a position in which you have high exposure and low complementarity. Right. Uh, what should we do? Uh, not go get another job and just give up. <laughs> okay. I, I actually do get a lot of people saying, oh, my God, Tina, like, oh, like software engineer is, is going to be automated. Should I just like quit school? Like, no, you should or not, not learn how to code. Yeah. Like, no, you should not quit school. That's a terrible idea. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like you do four years and you're like, oh, no, AI is going to take my job. I'm just going to like right. become a farmer. Like, that's like not uh, that's like not a great approach. Um, I mean, if you want to be a farmer, be a farmer, right? but not because of AI potentially taking right. over your role. Right. Right. So what I like to tell people is to think about the fact that um how can AI, like how can you yourself learn about this and actually use this yourself? For right. example, for content, right? right? If I'm going to be automated, yeah. I'm going to go automate myself because right. um, I'm going to be the best at automating myself because I'm in this industry, right? Like right. why would I sit here and wait for someone to go automate me when I could be incorporating these certain tools right. and be creating something even better um, right. and be able to shape what that role and what it is that it's going to look like in the future. Yeah. Um, another big thing is that if you're in that category um, and you you're just like, um, think about like how can you incorporate AI in order to progress the field that you're in. So it's not necessarily in terms of like I should just give up. It's more about okay, like then you should even more so learn about AI and right. realize what's happening in industry. Right. Like right. why not be the spearhead? Why not be spearheading that evolution right. um, process right. and then shaping it as opposed to just hoping it doesn't get you. <laughs> yeah. And in, in the end, so yeah. I really recommend like thinking about that. Learn about these tools. Um, 
it's always better to learn about these tools as opposed to try to hide from these tools. Mm-hmm. There's when the internet first came out, some people were like, "Oh no, like I hope the internet doesn't steal my job." Like honestly, a lot of people were like that. And the people who end up succeeding in in the sense of like succeeding of like using these adapting. tools, adapting, adapting, right? Yeah. They're the people who learn about these tools, approach it with open mindedness, yeah. and think about what can I do in order to actually thrive using these tools. What can I create? What are the new things I can do by having these tools?、Um, yeah. As opposed to just freaking out and、yeah. trying to like run away from the new technology. Yeah,、um, I was talking to a friend. He's like, AI is like a wave. You can either get on the board and ride the wave, or you can get submerged underneath. Exactly, or like just isolate yourself from society and、yeah. just <laughs> go. To, I don't know, be like a、um, you know, go hide somewhere,、uh, yeah. which which、yeah. is probably not not a great approach.、Um, so yeah, that's really、yeah. how I like to see it, and especially as someone. Who generally like I'm seriously in a field that's very easily automatable. Like, do I、yeah. not get scared? Obviously, I get scared, right? right? But I also know,、right. inherently speaking, that these things are going to happen, and I'm either going to jump on it or I'm just going to be the one being automated. So I'll rather be the one understand it and、exactly. sort of get ahead of it and and sort of evolve with it and see exactly because jobs ultimately also evolve、mm-hmm. as well. Oh yeah, absolutely! Like all these, there's jobs that they're evolving. There's new jobs that are created. There's jobs that are going to be lost. It's not just, it's not static. It never has been.、Um, so, just being able to understand that is is really important. Like the information that you shared is very practical, and it's a really great way to wrap my mind, and I think for our listeners to wrap their minds around. How to approach this technology and how to use this for their benefit. You know, this has been an, an incredible conversation. I've learned so much. Is there any message you want to leave our listeners? Ooh, keep learning, keep、yeah. learning. It really is.、Um, if you know how to learn, if you know how to self-study、um, and upskill yourself, you don't need to be afraid of anything because you will always find a way to adapt. Wow! Boom! Mic drop. <laughs> That's such a great way to end the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Tina.、Uh, and you know, you have mentioned an incredible amount of research and studies. And we will link your website. We will link all of the all the information you shared today.、Um, and thank you so much for coming here today and for sharing all this information. And such an honor! It's an honor to talk to you. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. If you would like to learn more about our conversation or our guests, check out the links below. Please subscribe, and if you're feeling extra generous, give us a five-star rating. We would love, love to hear from you, so leave us a comment. We'll read every one. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>